in the news, Long Island. And once again, this is WBAI New York 99.5 FM and WBAI.org. On the web, it is 5 p.m. Stay tuned. I have absolutely no pleasure in the stimulants in which I sometimes so madly indulge. It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I have periled life and reputation and reason. It has been the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness and a dread of some strange impending doom. Edgar Allan Poe. This is Behind a New Strong Island. It's time. Check. Check. Hey, yo, it's time. Hey, yo, it's time. It's time. Hey yo, it's time. We interrupt your programming to bring it to you live from the front lines. Strong animal, the gangs flee one time. Police is brutal like the streets is. Let my speech increase the peace through your speakers. Speak our weakness, of course, is division. Uh, caused by religion, race, poor, be in prison. Way more than the rich ones. The laws are the pawns for precision. My flow exposed flaws in the system. Look, you can't afford to be a bystander. Behind the news, we the lies die. We strive for high standards. The real power's in the hands. Of the people, politics, propaganda, it's so see through, and that's where we surge. The time is now for the youth in our boots, gotta stand our ground. Listen, Tuesdays at five, tune in to 99.5. East Sways reporting live behind the news. The radio will break from the norm as we advocate for change and reform. Behind the news, in the front while exposing the counterfeits, it's the new voice of empowerment. Behind the news, platform for the people it serves, where the truth and the speakers emerge. Politics meet their limitations. You get the real, never imitation. Behind the news, it's time, sweet. It's time, it's time. Buenas noches, familia. Good evening, family. Welcome to WBAI's Behind the News, Long Island. I am your host, Sergio Argueta, Serge. Uh, I want to start off by wishing everybody that's been listening a, a happy one-month anniversary. It's crazy, but it's already been... This is our fifth show of Behind the News, Long Island. We look forward to continuing to strengthen our format, our following, and most importantly, the, strength, uh, the strengthening of the collective voice. While I've had the pleasure of hosting the show, I recognize day in and day out that it's the collective voice that's what WBA is all about uh, community voices community radio so let your voices be heard follow us on Facebook Twitter Instagram behind the news li or strong surge strong surge today's talk stop don't shoot except we're not talking about gun violence or police brutality tonight to tonight we're talking about heroin the devastating impact on lives families the climbing death toll and the detrimental uh, the, the toll that it's taking on thousands of families across Long Island and hundreds of thousands ac uh, across this nation. We're also talking solutions, recovery, treatment, and the great changes to policy that some advocates have been working on. Uh, we have some incredible folks that are doing some outstanding work in the studio today. That is a song titled Hate Me by Blue October. It's a, it's a powerful song that, that really gives an opportunity of a guy trying to overcome addiction, uh, the, the, the opportunity to push away his family, his mother. Uh, it, it was written for his mother. And he's telling those that, that are there to support him, he's pushing them away and he's telling them to hate him. And it really talks about the, the frustrations, the desperation, and, and the self-deprecation being felt by young people across this country and families. Uh, of those that are dealing with addiction. For many, it's hard to believe that Long Island is now, you know, synonymous with the word heroin. 
The LIE 495 is referred to as the heroin highway. Uh, and as a result, we're losing a record number of, of people. Uh, back in 2013, we lost a record high 144. And this is, and, and this is just a, a low number considering the 400 people that were saved as a result of Narcan. Uh, tonight, we're talking to those that are on the front lines of this plague, those that are trying to fight back and, and, and really give our families and our young people an opportunity to overcome addiction. Uh, there are people that know this firsthand. All of our panelists are a part of a collaborative effort titled FIST, Families in Need of, of uh, Families in Support of Treatment, I'm sorry. But they're each doing their own thing as well. Uh, today, we have Tom Goris. He's a uh, part of an organization called I'm Not Anonymous. We have Nora Milligan, who's a, a member of FIST. Uh, we have Anthony Rizzuto from Seafield Center. And we have Linda Ventura, uh, who's the founder of, of an organization called Thomas is Hope. And she also is a, a panelist. Folks, thank you so much for coming in. Nora and, and Linda, I'd really like to get started with you guys. First off, I'd like to start off by commending you. I mean, you guys are, are doing some incredible stuff. You have been working on this issue for, for a few you know, months and years. If that, but the, the accolades, the work that you've done is, is incredible. I want to start off with both of you. I, I was able to read a little bit about you. I was able to see you on YouTube, see some of the outstanding work that you've been doing. Can you tell our listeners what's your connection to this heroin epidemic? Tell us about who you are, where you live, where you come from, and, and why are you working on this issue? Well, I'm Linda Ventura. I unfortunately am the founder of Thomas's Hope because on March 14, 2012, my middle son died due to what the medical examiner called a heroin overdose, but he died to the disease of addiction. So I knew then that I would do something in his name and to fight against the insidious drug called heroin. Uh, and in 2000, and 13, I began Thomas's Hope, met Anthony Rizzuto, and the rest has been quite a year for us the last couple of years. That's okay. My name's Nora Milligan. Um, it's really great to be here and, uh, again, to have a voice. You know, we have to have a voice, and the community needs to come out and speak. And um, I'm the parent of a recovering heroin addict, and the way I got involved with FIST and met Anthony was through the frustrations of denied treatment access. and. Um, this is a chronic disease process and so every time I would try to get help from my son we would meet a lot of obstacles that uh, would deny him treatment at the correct level which would just enhance the progression of his disease and uh, increase his chances of death. Um, so that frustration and that fear would really drive me to fight back against the insurance companies that weren't uh, allowing him to access treatment that he needed, life-saving treatment. And through that frustration um, I, I became uh, involved in FIST and you know, found the voice that we need to have to come together to uh, shift this legislation and, uh, you know, let people know this is a public health crisis. It's not um, something that needs to be criminalized. It's, uh, these are good kids that make bad choices and this is a disease process and the families have to get involved. The families suffer immensely um, with the powerlessness over the addiction and, and watching their loved one make these bad choices that sometimes can prove fatal. When you talk about the struggle of seeing someone you love go through this, this, these, these challenges, you know, good kids that made bad decisions, where did it start, you know, in terms of, of what you witnessed with your children? Uh, how old were they? Uh, you know, were there tall tale signs? Was, what, what was it, you know, that, that you think, uh, what were sort of the steps? The gateway drug was marijuana, marijuana and beer. And unfortunately, as a parent, you don't know if your child has that turnoff valve inside their head. So a lot of kids smoke pot, drink beer. Not all of them become addicted. However, my son became addicted, and he went on. His marijuana use be became chronic. He moved on into pills. And his uh, after high school, when children go on to college, he went to his first rehab. Mm. And we began the fight with the insurance companies. You know, and, and as Nora was saying, I heard the incredible words, uh, your, your son's not high enough for treatment. What does that even mean? It's incredible. Nora? You know, I would have to agree uh, with Linda <coughs> that uh, the gateway drugs, um, I had this really relaxed attitude about, you know, I knew my son was experimenting with marijuana and beer, and 
I had this really relaxed attitude and, and part of that I think was denial. Um, if I could go back, you know, turn back the hands of time, I, I would say to myself and any other parent that's, that's witnessing this behavior in their adolescent that that relaxed attitude is, is unacceptable. Kids shouldn't be experimenting because what could be just experimenting for one child, if that child, the same child is uh, prone to the disease of addiction environmentally or physically, um, this can prove to be a very fatal choice for them. And then for these uh, young people, the accessibility to gain access to pills is very easy today. It's easier for them to get, you know, an oxycodone than it is for them to get a beer. And you know, I really think that stems from um, the source being, uh, you know, the um, the doctors that are over prescribing medications. You know, we think that the, the biggest enemy is the drug dealer on the corner, when in reality, it's the inappropriate prescribing practices of very unknowledgeable uh, physicians. And a, and a perceived public safety. You know, the United States is like 4.6% uh, of the population of the world and we consume over 80% of opiates in this world. And that's something we have to look at and we have to shift and we need our doctors to get educated. We need an educated leadership to come out of this. Again, it's a healthcare crisis, not something that should be criminalized. And we need to start to look at the source of where are these, kidding, these kids getting such easy access to drugs. The, the paradigm that, that you framed, right, the, the way you frame the issue uh, in terms of it being a health issue, uh, this is something that is preventable. Uh, this is something where we need to address uh, the issues, the gateways. And, and, you know, I mean, a relaxed attitude towards marijuana use, you know, in adolescence is one thing, but we know that one of the biggest gateways, like you just mentioned, are opiates, are over-the-counter, are things that our parents are using. What was it you know, that, that you think sort of opened the door for your children? Well, for, for my son, he was, you know, having a, he was addicted to marijuana. He was using that daily, drinking. And when you're in that frame of mind, you're willing to try, take, and increase your high. Because now you want more. What got you high is not going to continue to get you high. And you want a bigger better buzz so that the disease is a fatal progressive disease and children will look to go and get bigger better things and try it why not why not let's try it Nora there was there's also a, a a belief out there that that drug issues uh, in terms of drug addiction will that happen in certain communities mm -hmm. uh, that that these issues you know there's an image that comes to mind when you think drug dealer, when you think about, I mean, certainly the Rockefeller drug laws, right? And how many people of color in particular went away for drug use, uh, for being drug addicts. Uh, when we talk about that transition, can you tell our listeners who's using heroin and, and where do they come from? Is it, is it an equal opportunity employer, in other words? Who, who's being most impacted by this? It, it's absolutely an equal opportunity um, situation. It, it just transcends everything from financial to cultural to socioeconomic status. It, it knows no boundaries. It goes anywhere. And again, you know, progression is the key word here. It's a progressive fatal disease. So what starts out is smoking pot, drinking beer. Again, if you're prone to addiction, either environmentally or physically, you know, you're not going to just pass through a phase and move on. You're going to get hooked into it and you're going to look for that bigger, better high, which for most of these kids is the access to pills. But then what happens is, is you gain a tolerance to an opiate, so you need to take more and more of the opiate in order to achieve the euphoria. So that becomes an expensive thing if you're a 16-year-old kid and you don't have a job, you know, and, and you can't find access to money, then eventually you're going you're gonna to be pushed over into heroin. It's a cheaper, easier high and it's very accessible. And that's what we're seeing happen with laws like iStop that are, again, clamping down on the doctors. It needs to happen. It absolutely needs to happen. But you're going to see a fallout now, which is where we're at with this epidemic of kids that are already hooked in. And they can't get the pills now, so they're shifting over to heroin to achieve that high and to maintain their dependency. Because if they stop, they get sick. It's, they're physically yeah. dependent on it. When, when you folks were dealing with this reality inside your homes, and you <coughs> see, I mean, you know, as a father, I, I can... I can't imagine, you know, seeing someone you love, someone you brought into this world, and you see them headed down this, this one-way street that is definitely destructive and will most likely end up either incarceration or death. 
when you start trying to to save your child how easy was it how difficult was it what were what were sort of the the barriers that you that you in, in, encountered in terms of providing treatment well first off when you start to deal with a 17 or 18 year old child you're going they're going to pull out every sting, single manipulative stop that they can possibly say please mom don't know you know so you want to believe that there isn't such a big problem you want to believe that but you can't believe that you have to put your big girl pants on and your 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 child has been hijacked and a host has been left and your child is not there anymore it it is guided by the drug called heroin and it leaves a, manip a manip manipulative thief in your child's place that will do everything and anything to get its next fix. Steal your jewelry, steal your money, steal whatever it is in your house. They're gonna take it, sell it. I unfortunately, after my son died, we went to look for the new lawnmower and that, had, that was gone. So that was so sad to me that that desperation went down to a lawnmower. You know, how, how he suffered, you know, in that disease and how stops were put in his place to get treatment at every available turn. Can you talk about some of those stops? The insurance company saying, uh, well, he, you know, he can't die from detox. You'll want to kill yourself while you're detoxing, but you won't die from it. Uh, t you know, 28 days is not necessary. We tried that once before, so that, you know, all of these things. He's not high enough for treatment. That one still boggles my mind. It resonates with me. He's not high enough for treatment. Would you like us to go out? Should he go out and shoot up another three bags? I mean, it, it makes no sense. So I've paid my premiums, and I have my, my, you know, it's covered in my policy. Why the stops go up? Why? Only for heroin users. So, you know, it, it makes no sense. So that's why we went up last year and we advocated for the changes in the legislation and I'm proud to say that in June 2014 Governor Cuomo signed those bills into effect. They go into effect April 1st of 2015 and the insurance companies are already doing their best to try not to pay as of April 1st 2015. Mm -hmm. Nora can you can you talk to us about you know some of the I mean, talk about corporate greed, right? We're talking about insurance companies, and I think that this is somewhere where a number of WBAI listeners truly understand this scam. When we talk about insurance companies and premiums being paid, but they implement things like fail-first policies, uh, so many of our young people that have passed away, so many people that have passed away apparently, you know, and, and I, I believe this was Linda's case in terms of her son as well, we're, we're on that last high, meaning their, their thought, their mind frame was, let me get high one last time before I kick this and go into treatment tomorrow. Can we talk about the importance in time frame and time lapse in terms of saying you have to fail first? There is no guarantee. What are your thoughts? Yeah, there's just one word that comes to mind, and that's just it's a travesty. You know, it's um, it's just unacceptable to treat a, um, a health care crisis like this by intervening at the lowest level possible and, and then seeing if they fail at that in order to go up to the highest level possible. It's like showing up into the emergency room and you're complaining of chest pain and you're having a heart attack and they say, well, why don't you go home and take an aspirin, try some physical therapy and get back to us. That person's gonna go home and they're gonna die. You know, it's a process for the family. You know, as much as the addict suffers from denial, the family does too, it was my experience that, that there was some denial there because it's terrifying. If you accept that your child has the disease of addiction, you also have to accept that they could die. So you, you have to get some help. You have to get some support in this. And they teach you in the support that the addict do, does have to go through some stages so that they get to the point where they're willing to ask for help. And as the parent, you have to allow them some consequences. It's incredibly painful, incredibly scary, but I stood by and I, I watched my son go through things and then he got to that point where he was hospitalized and, and those words came out of his mouth, I want help. I've been waiting for months and months and months and I was just, I was floored that the insurance company said no. He had suffered a seizure uh, related to withdrawals from uh, narcotics that he was abusing and the fact that they said he wasn't appropriate for an inpatient center just, just blew my mind. 
and that's what started me uh, with fighting with the insurance companies. It's uh, it's unacceptable to ask for them to fail first because subsequently they released him from that hospital and within that year he suffered two overdoses. And I truly believe if they had placed him at the correct level of care, he would have they would have intervened and he might not have subsequently had those overdoses, which by the way, he's only alive because of the, the drug Narcan, that he was revived. And so it's a lot of great things happening with that drug. It, it stops a person from overdosing uh, that results in death, but it doesn't stop overdosing. We have to start having the talk about how can we get to them before they're overdosing. We need to start intervening at the correct level of care, which is what this legislation puts in place. You know, it's what I'm still an ongoing part of a work group that's, that's uh, formulating these laws. So when it's released in April, we have a formulation that starts to place these uh, recovering addicts at the correct level of intervention, not the lowest working to the highest, but rather the highest working to the lowest. Excellent. One of the, one of the things that comes to mind as I hear both of you and, and the way you're able to, to discuss this issue and this challenge, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions here, okay? I'm looking at two, you know, uh, young ladies in their 20s and 30s, right? I won't tell you <laughs> that, right? Um, but I'm imagining you guys come from middle, middle class neighborhoods, if not, you know, even, even better than that. And I'm thinking about two women that can that that are articulate, that that are educated, that have resources, Able that go out there you know. and really advocate fiercely for their child. I'm now trying to sort of change your view, and I'm thinking about someone who's poor, someone who doesn't even have insurance, a mother or a father out there that is dealing with the same epidemic that comes and lives in the exact same community. What chance do they have in terms of accessing services? What, what, you know, what, how, how steep is that hill? And, you know, is that something that we're, that, that you guys are taking a look at? In terms Medicaid of does cover for uh, addiction treatment. Uh, and a lot of people in affluent neighborhoods end up having to throw their children out and off their insurance policies to get coverage. Now, if we think about that as New York State residents, and I pay my insurance premiums, and they're steep, and my coverage is not there when I need to access it, now the burden falls onto each tax-paying resident of New York State to fund the treatment of all the people suffering from this disease. So the insurance companies get richer, and we burden all that cost for treatment that should be covered by the insurance company. Well, and we're seeing this stuff with healthcare, right? This is a healthcare debate. Yes. You know that we're talking about here, while the companies continue to reap the benefits of of this uh, of this plan that ultimately benefits them and doesn't benefit the taxpayer. Uh, Nora, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just I mean, absolutely. That was the progression of things with myself. You know, I. I'm employed, I'm educated, I had private insurance. Uh, my son started his first treatment program at 15 years old. By the time he was 19, my benefits were exhausted. I was going into my own pockets to facilitate treatment for him. And my home was in foreclosure. I filed bankruptcy, I lost everything. It, it flattened me. And then he qualified for Medicaid and that was the situation we found ourselves in. He was hospitalized, Medicaid, they refused him. And he was treated, he overdosed, he was incarcerated. All of that, all that, those expenses now went to the state. So there's the cost shifting that goes on. It's just a perfect progression, and it and it, and it bankrupt me, and all the all that money got shifted. And in, to date, the insurance company has never paid for his his inpatient treatments. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take a small break now. It's it's hard to believe we're already at the half hour. When we right. come back, by the grace of God, Katy Perry. Um, you know when when we talk about breaking those chains and I'm, I'm thinking and, and envisioning someone that that's that's buried six feet deep you know while, while they're alive right I'm imagining how hard must it be to, to, to get yourself out of that ditch uh, today we have individuals that that have been there and done that and not only have they been there and done that but they're actually you know helping save the lives of other uh, Tom Goris from I am not anonymous and Anthony Rizzuto from Seafield. I'd, I'd like to mention he's also uh, earning a master's in social work from Adelphi University. I'm real proud of him and seeing where he's going and his trajectory and, and the great, the good that he's doing with that social work degree. It's, it's outstanding. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks, Tom, you. you know, can, can, you, can you tell us about, about the struggle? Can you tell us about the challenges? 
Um, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't start off as a struggle for me. It started off as fun. Um, I mean, going back to the first time, you know, thinking about what happened and being 12, 13 years old, I had an opportunity to smoke a cigarette and, you know, some kid came over to me and he's like, you know, you're not cool if you, if you cough. You got to inhale and don't cough. So I was able to inhale and not cough and the reaction I got from my peers was instant acceptance. So later in life came around and um, that same opportunity came up with a, with, a, with a glass of alcohol and, you know, if you puke, you're not cool, so don't puke, but drink all of it. So I drank it all and I didn't puke and instantaneously I was cool. So that, that acceptance that I got from my friends right off the bat really, um, I guess, fueled um, me to continue to be that person because I wasn't feeling like I was that person inside myself. So I, I was feeling a void very easily um, by just drinking a drink and having my peers accept me. When you, when you hear, uh, you know, both Linda and Nora and you hear their struggles, I'm imagining that, that you can think of the things that you put your mother through. Um, you know, and, and can you express uh, the difficulties and those challenges and why was it so difficult to, to, to pull back and, and, and turn that vehicle around? Sure, absolutely. I was very selfish, self-seeking, inconsiderate, and I was frightened during the whole entire process. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a struggle. You know, it's, it, it's, it's fun. The fun becomes a problem. That problem becomes a way of life. And I chase the drugs and... You know, the drugs run my life. It's, it's survival. Uh, I, I don't have a choice anymore to stop it once it gets to that point of being hopeless. And, you know, I didn't know, nor did I, and, and, nor did I really care at one point who I was affecting. All I really cared about was my next high. Because I, every time I woke up, I had to put a needle in my arm to feel like I could start my day. Um, you know, if things happened throughout the day, good or bad, it was an excuse for me to use, good or bad. Um, and I would just justify it to myself, all right, yeah, I got a great deal, $20,000 deal, awesome, go get some heroin. Or if my, my boss yelled at me, you know, it was okay, well, I'm going to sit in the bathroom and not out for an hour and use heroin. You know, that was my solution to everything. You know, I didn't understand that the problem was with, within me. I, I just thought that uh, the problem was everybody else, you know, trying to get me help. You know, I, I'll, I'll stop when I want to. Well, I, at that point, I didn't have a choice whether I wanted to stop or not. It was, it was, I was so consumed, and every time I did try to stop on my own, it was I was, I failed, and you know I didn't I didn't know about different avenues I could turn to. Uh, I, I thought someone with drug addiction um, didn't look like me. I thought someone with drug addiction um, went to rehab. I thought someone with drug addiction lived under a bridge. Uh, you know. I, it, I didn't associate with that. I didn't associate with, uh, you know, I had a job and I had a girlfriend, I had a car, I had all those things I thought a drug addict wouldn't have. But, um, you know, through the whole process of, of struggling, you know, um, heroin eventually did bring, my, bring me to my knees two years into it and I finally did surrender. And um, it, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my entire life, coming to that point and saying, no mas, no more. Do you remember where you were, how it happened, like how that, you know, when was it? Um, there was two occasions, actually. The first time, I had just come home from Chicago from a business trip, and during the business trip, I had pills from my doctor, which I ran out on a Tuesday night, and by Wednesday, I had Googled where to buy, Chica where to buy heroin in Chicago, and 45 minutes later, I had um, heroin. So um, I knew where I was going, and down the road, I didn't want to go down, so... Saturday came along. I went down. I went to uh, a treatment facility, and they told me um, they didn't. At the time, I had Aetna insurance. They told me they don't take Aetna coverage, and you know, all I wanted to do was stop. I didn't want to go to that th the depths of um, of where I knew I was going and continuing with heroin. So I, it was it was really hard because all I wanted to do was stop, and, and I went to get treatment, and they wouldn't wouldn't let me in the doors. They wouldn't let me take care of myself, and I had the coverage I was paying for. So I, you know, I walked out on the process of going to another place, hysterical crying. I dropped to my knees and I looked up at the sky and I, and I asked God, why is it so hard to get treatment but so easy to get drugs? And that moment was my first struggle with getting treatment. A week later, I had a needle in my arm for the first time, which I Googled how to do. And two years later, I finally came to surrendering and uh, went out to Long Island Center for Recovery, and I was non-compliant with the detox process, which means I wouldn't take any Suboxone or Subutex or Methadone.
to combat the withdrawals, to have an easy process of going through withdrawals, and as a result, my insurance company cut me. And um, they gave me an opportunity to go to outpatient, which I already failed at, or go down to a treatment center in Florida. And, you know, I looked them right in the eye and I said, well, if you send me home, I'm going to die in an hour. And they said, well, now you can't go home. And I said, great. <laughs> and they sent me down to Florida, and, you know, 35 days later, um, and I, I came home uh, excited to enter recovery. Anthony, when, when you hear these stories and you hear things like an insurance company saying, I can't provide treatment because they haven't failed enough, an outpatient, or they're not suicidal or homicidal. I mean, it, you know, to hear Tom say that he actually had to talk about taking his life before he was taken seriously. And in a way, I mean, to me, if, if you're injecting, you know, this poison into your vein or you're snorting it, it it's, those are suicide attempts, right? Um, what what are your takes on on this as a professional and in terms of your work? What's what's your perspective on all of this? I mean, I just think it's it's pathetic. You know, uh, unfortunately, inherent in the disease of addiction is that I don't have a problem, and and that's inherent in the illness. And it's you know a lot of times the people that love you and care about you are fighting with you to accept help, and sometimes it's six days, six months, six years, and and the person who struggles finally comes to a point where they say, okay, I'll go. And you take them to a place, and the place does an evaluation. A trained professional says, you need to be in detox, or you need to be in rehab. And then an insurance company that's in a whole completely different other state, you know, that really has no clue as to what's going on. And they'll say, um, withdrawal from opiates is not lethal or you have to fail an outpatient first. It, it's, it's sad, it's sad. I mean, I thought the ladies did a great job. I thought Nora really talked about how is it possible that we're starting at the lowest level of care, we're not giving them the appropriate level of care, and the message being uh, you have to fail first. And I would add one more line to that. You have to fail first, not die, and then we'll talk about possibly going to inpatient. And even at that point, you know, their policy gives them 30 days per calendar year. They'll give you three days five days. So, you know, I, I see cost shifting going on. I see stuff happening where they're neglecting their need to pay for what people have put into their policy. Dr. Jeff Reynolds, one of the authorities, right, on Long Island in mm -hmm. terms of this heroin epidemic, uh, said something in one of the local media outlets, and he said something to the effect of, it's like getting shot and having someone walk into a, an emergency room and saying, okay, let me try this Band-Aid out. You know, let me know how that works and then get back to me. Anthony, when, when we talk about societal costs, when we talk about, for example, families that have to literally lose everything and fall into poverty, um, you know, day in and day out in terms of, you know, preparing for this program, I was reading about the, the financial costs, the emotional costs, the societal costs. Can you talk about some of that and how this impacts all of us? Absolutely. I mean, if you go back, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Medford Pharmacy shootings. Somebody went to buy cough syrup that day and didn't make it home. And they had nothing to do with this illness. Can, you, can you tell our listeners Yeah, absolutely. That so basically what happened a couple of years ago, uh, David Laffer and someone else, uh, his assistant, um, they were strung out and they were looking to get the next one. They went into the Medford Pharmacy and uh, looking to rob the drugs and they killed four people in the process. Uh, shortly after that, in Seaford, there was another pharmacy shooting. You know, you, you're dealing with some of the most powerful drugs in the world, and, and people who were not criminals became criminals just to be able to get the next one. The withdrawal from opiates is brutal, and what people are willing to do is mind-boggling. I mean, when you're talking about people being willing to give up their kids, people being willing to give up their freedom, people... There, there is no boundaries to where it could go. So, you know, the disease of addiction, and I'm, I'm glad that there was some discussion about, I know this show is about heroin today, but it is so important for us to understand. In my experience, I've had over a 1,000 patients over the last 13 years. My experience is not one of them started with heroin. Mm -hmm. And what I'll tell you is that every single one, 100% of the people that use heroin, it was either cigarettes, alcohol, or marijuana. That's where it started. Not everybody that smokes cigarettes, drinks alcohol or marijuana will become a heroin addict, but everyone that is has gone down that path first. So I can't emphasize enough, let's not just poo-poo the idea of, um, you know, well, it's only weed, it's only marijuana, it's only beer that they're drinking. Anthony, I'm, I'm thinking about a 20-year-old or even a 15-year-old right now that, that may be tuning into our station as they're going from, you know, the more popular ones that spit garbage and they've actually stopped on this one to hear, to hear the conversation, right? 
What do you say to someone that's listening to Tom's story or that's listening to, you know, Linda and Nora and saying there's no way I'll ever get to that point? I just smoke weed. You know, I just drink a little bit of beer. I just smoke cigarettes. There's no way. What do you say to them? You know, I've had that situation in group. I've had people that, you know, just smoke pot. I had a guy just smoke pot. And I said, just hang on a second, because he doesn't see himself as having a problem. And when I went around the room and I asked everybody what did they do, and they were into bigger and better things, and I said, what was the first thing you did? And I said, so, you know, there's a possibility that maybe you're going to stay at marijuana, but the odds are against you. And if you, you're going to roll those dice to go there, and I have to tell you, the other thing is that marijuana today is not marijuana of yesterday. Now they got this new stuff out called wax, and the level of THC content is through the roof. So, you know, but we, we, we also have to take a look at another thing. Why are people so uncomfortable in their skin that they're looking to alter their state of mind? And if you look at the increased anxiety level in young people today and looking to get disconnected and looking to shut themselves off, I mean, it's through the roof. So, you know, you used the word prevention before. And, and you know, I work in the treatment field, but I honestly believe that, yes, we need to treat the people that have the illness now. But we also need to take a look at how do we prevent people from getting into it to begin with. And for the people that do achieve recovery, how do we support that recovery? What can we do? What's in place to help them to sustain that recovery? Because it isn't you get recovery and, and you're cured. There is no cure that we know of today for addiction. When, we, when I hear you speaking about, about the challenges that our young people are facing, I mean, we know that anxiety levels are through the roof when it comes to our young people, particularly now. We know that bullying is a major issue. We talked about peer pressure in here. We talked about self-esteem. Right? We talked about all these different things that cause our young people to, to, to deviate from the right path. And I'm envisioning a young kid in Hempstead that, you know, is, is going to strap on some gang colors and jump in a car and go do a drive-by shooting. And I'm thinking about a kid in an affluent community that is strapping, you know, a, a belt around his or her arm and is about to shoot this poison into their veins. They suffer from the same uh, uh, issues, right, and challenges. Tom, where do we go in terms of prevention? Now, now let, let, let's shift gears. Let's start talking prevention. Let's start talking about some of the things that FIST is doing, uh, what, what your individual movements are doing, your organizations. Talk to me about that. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you, you talked about, um, you know, shame before. You talked about remaining silent and remaining silent about what's going on, the problem, don't talk about it. You know, and that's kind of what I was told when I first came around in my recovery. Um, I was lucky enough to, to enter into the bubble of treatment and from the bubble of treatment, um, I was able to enter into 12-step uh, fellowships. Um, they've been able to um, inform me of, uh, of, of how to, you know, sustain my recovery, pretty much. And along the lines, um, you know, this word anonymity was, was slapped in my, in, in my lap. And, you know, I, I, I was told when I first came around to be a, a good member of the fellowship I was, I was in, you know, not to break my personal an anonymity on a public uh, you know, press radio or film or anything like that. Don't talk about it. Keep it silent still. And I, it never really always sat well with me. I was like, what is this all about? Like, why? Like, I walk in here, you tell me I'm as sick as, I'm as, sick as my secrets, but remain, remain, keep my personal and, and my recovery as a secret. Like, I, I didn't get it. And um, it didn't feel right to me. And the other thing I was told, too, was to pay forward the love and support that I was so freely given to me very early in my recovery which saved my life and that's what I got that's what stuck with me that that passion and drive to help another person um, really stuck with me and as a result of that um, I was able to um, create a project called I am not anonymous with my girlfriend I'm a person in recovery from substance use disorder um, and she's a photographer a professional photographer so um, you know pretty much what our, our mission is is pretty for years those suffering from addiction have done so in silence and as a result the negative stigma surrounding it, as a result of the negative stigma surrounding it, excuse me, the truth is people do recover. Our mission is to bring the solution into the conversation in the hopes of helping millions of people who remain untreated and help the world understand that addiction is not a moral failing. It is a powerful d disease, and the stigma associated with is just as deadly as the disease itself. So, you know, what we do is we put a face and a voice to a person in recovery. They have a portrait, essay series, and... Uh, the whole the whole idea is, you know, don't be ashamed of who you are. Um, come out, talk about it, and as a result of that, the general public will be able to see who we truly, really are. You know, for the longest time, if you look back at history, um, we've always been villa the villains of the, of the society, of these bad people, these criminals, and 
you know, lock up your kids, they're coming for you kind of uh, kind of uh, attitude. But that's not the truth at all. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a nephew, I'm, I'm a grandson, I'm a voter, I'm a licensed insured driver, mm-hmm. and, all, and, uh, and on the weekends I work out, summertime I like to go to the beach, <laughs> I have friends, um, I care about people. And, you know, and also, yes, I, I'm a person in recovery some, from substance use disorder. That is part of my life, too. But I'm so much more than that today. Amen. Well, our, our, our youth are more than their mistakes, right? Amen. All, all human beings are more than their mistakes. Nora, I'm thinking, you know, we, you and I were talking before the show about this, uh, this guilt that a number of our parents start facing or the way they're shamed by society uh, in terms of, well, this, clearly this is a, a, fi- a, a parental failure. Uh, what what words of encouragement would you lend to parents out there right now that are at the first step uh, where you were, you know, a certain amount of years ago? What, what would you say to them? Oh, absolutely. It's a conversation that needs to be had without shame and guilt. And um, but, but it takes time to get there. You know, you need support. And you have to reach out and get support in your community, find resources and other parents. And, and there's plenty out there. Just, you know, FIST alone, that's one of our goals is to uh, point parents in the direction of the resources they need to get support to come to acceptance of what's going on with their kids and you know if your kid is diagnosed with cancer you can go to work and you can talk about that and people have you know Mm. empathy for you Mm. and and they can be supported but if your kid suffers from addiction you know we kind of hide in the shadows and and I would really say even this legislation that was passed this past June is a result of parents coming out of the darkness finding their voices, coming together and saying, you know, this is unacceptable anymore. We won't hide in the, in the shadows. This, this disease thrives off of shame, guilt, the darkness, you know, and like Tom said, you know, we have to break down the walls of, of shame. You know, I'm, I'm an educated woman. I'm a critical care registered nurse, and I'm also a woman in long-term recovery from drugs and alcohol. My life is successful, you know. I you know, have to deal with this disease being present in my son, and um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the support that I get through my recovery and through my parent recovery. I couldn't do it alone. There's no way I could do it alone. But the shame has to go, and this is a conversation that needs to be had. That work is, That's is a, a big part of recovery. We know it's a part of the 12-step model. We know it's a part of so much. You, you can't do this alone. Uh, Linda, you know, you, you mentioned uh, starting Thomas's Hope. Can you talk to us a little bit about Thomas's Hope and what, what you're doing and uh, where you're going? Well, th- when Thomas's Hope first, first was uh, founded, my intent was to scholarship uninsured people into recovery. However, now it's shifted, and I want a family center for families to come to be able to have the support necessary because when when the person in recovery comes out of treatment they need to come back to a healthy atmosphere you can't come back to the same people that your family was when you were addicted so and and I also want to have a sober house because these kids we're sending them away from Long Island and they need to be able to come back and be supported in an atmosphere that fosters their sobriety on on every level uh, you know, I want to go back to even with the stigma. My son was a charismatic, handsome, sarcastic, funny kid. I have three kids. He was awesome. He was a Division One. He was scouted to play Division One lacrosse in the ninth grade. He was a great kid. He was not what his disease made him into. Uh, that's what all these young, they're all good kids that make a mistake. And... I don't really care what anybody else thinks of me or my family because they haven't walked in my shoes. So anyone can criticize, but you know, I take many phone calls every single day from parents all over Long Island looking, please, what do I do? How do I do this? What else can I, you know, and they need to be directed to family programs. Family needs to get healthy as well as the person struggling with the disease. Strengthening families, there's an idea, right? Mm-hmm. Anthony, as we uh, as we come down to the last couple of minutes, can you talk to us about resources? If you're on Long Island, if you're in New York State, I know there's a website, uh, heroinprevention.com. I know that FIST is on Facebook. It's combatheroin.ny.gov. 
Okay. Well, I mean, there's a number of resources, but go ahead. Can you can you tell us about those resources? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the good thing is is that there are a bunch of resources available. The problem is sometimes making the connection between the two. Um, you can go to the Nassau County Heroin Task Force uh, website. Um, you can go to Combat Heroin uh, for through Oasis. You can go to the FIST website. You can go to the Facebook page. So there are a lot of resources that are available. You know, I just want to make clear, I, I usually start off my family sessions by saying that people that struggle with the disease of addiction are not bad people. They're sick people that need help. And that's something that's really important for us to understand. I'm glad everyone touched on the stigma. And the stigma is not just limited to the person that struggles with the illness. The family struggles with the, with the stigma as well. And it's important for us to kind of squash that and understand that, hey, it's an illness. And, and if you don't struggle with this illness, sometimes it's hard for you to understand. Certainly. This is just the first time we've discussed this issue. Um, you know, I have a number of panelists that we're going to be bringing back. I definitely want to make the connection about, you know, the, genera the generational issues, right? Um, I mean, you know, addiction is a disease. It's communicable. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, is inherent in, in so many different ways, and we have to channel that. It's unfortunate that we've already come uh, to the end of our show um, but, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, I thank each and every last one of you for coming in here and, and sharing your story. I know it's not easy. You're doing some outstanding work. And the same way I told you guys in the beginning, to anyone that's listening out there, mi casa es su casa, right? Our house is your house. That's what WBAI is all about. I want to thank Brother Reggie Johnson for holding down the boards this and every week. Uh, he's, you know, he's always looking out for us, making sure we, we, we sound great. Uh, next week, we're talking about geographic racism, segregation, redlining, and foreclosures. Uh, a lot of issues on Long Island, and, and we're, we're addressing it all. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, Strong Surge, S-T-R-O-N-G-S-E-R-G. -E Join us every Tuesday, 5 to 6, spread the word. And remember, one mic, one voice. It's not your community. It's not my community. It's our community. And if we don't take care of it, who will? Peace. Strong Island, stand up. Check. Hey yo, it's time. Hey yo, it's time. It's time. Hey yo, it's time. We interrupt your program and bring it to you live from the front lines. Strong out of the gangs fleeing one time. Police is brutal like the streets is. Let my speech increase the peace through your speakers. Speak our weakness, of course, is division. Uh, caused by religion, race, poor, be in prison. Way more than the rich ones. The laws are the pawns for position. My flow exposed flaws in the system. Look, you can't afford to be a bystander. Behind the news, we the lies die. We strive for high standards. The real power's in the hands of the people. Politics, propaganda, it's all see through. And that's where we serve. The time is now for the youth in our boots. Gotta stand our ground. Listen Tuesdays at five. Tune in to 995 five. East Ways. Reporting live behind the news. Radio will break from the norm. As we advocate for change and reform. Behind the news. Unifying while exposing the counterfeits. It's the new voice of empowerment. Behind the new platform for the people it serves. Where the truth and your speakers emerge. Behind the news. Where politics meet their limitations. You get the real, never imitation. Behind the news.